I was already a practicing physician when I started taking improv classes. In fact, I had zero theater experience when my wife got me introductory improv lessons for Christmas. Thank God I did, because of all the life that has happened to both me and to society since then. When I started, I didn't know how my career was going to grow, but improv was a nice way to get out of the house and laugh. I was not one of those people who predicted that a worldwide pandemic would come and make my work life, let's say, uncertain. I didn't know that there would be a calendar year where I had five cancer diagnoses in my immediate family members, and I'd be on the other side of healthcare. A lot of life happens in eight years, and for me, all of it was better. Not necessarily good, but better because my wife got me that Christmas gift. So we're on the same page. Improv is any performance that's made up in the moment. There is a whole taxonomy that could take up the rest of the day, which I will spare you. My gift was in introductory long-form improv at a local theater. Then there's applied improv. That's taking the skills, exercises, and principles from improv theater and then applying it to a new context. That was something I was unaware was an area of study when I started applying improv in my work in the hospital. Starting out improv, there was no expectation of anything greater coming from my weekly activities. There would be weeks off in the class schedule, and it would feel like I had forgotten anything I had ever learned about the art form ever during the break. To lessen that feeling, I started practicing improv at work. Now, whenever I tell people that, they give me a weird look, and I think it's because they envision me taking patients out into the hallway and forcing them to do scenes with me. <laughs> I have yet to do that. What I have done is take the exercise from class and practice the skills necessary for that exercise at my job in the hospital. As an example, one of the first exercises we did was called a three-line opener, in that two people walk out on stage without having any idea what they're going to say or even what the conversation is going to be about. The first person says a line. The second person responds. Then the first person gives one more line of dialogue. And then within those three lines, they're expected to get out the who, what, when, and why of the two characters' relationship. Similarly, I use the skills from that exercise to get on the same page with my patients right at the start of our conversation. It provided an immediate sense of relief as I was balancing clarifying who I was and what my purpose was, as well as inviting them to share what was important to them in that moment. <laughs> Finding common ground in the complexity of the unknown on stage provided proof of concept for this style of communication, as well as allowing me to feel the benefit. I work in the hospital, and I'm oftentimes seeing patients on one of the worst days of their life, although many people have told me they would rather be my patient than perform on stage with me. <laughs> For most of my life, I would have been in that same camp of avoiding any type of public speaking, which is another nice thing about improv, is it slowly pushed me past the edge of my previous comfort zone, and I never really noticed because I was laughing the entire time. <laughs> So during this time of converting the improv exercises from my weekly class into applied activities at work, my patient satisfaction scores improved the most of anyone in my group. I thought it was pretty cool uh, that my nighttime extracurricular activity was helping me professionally for once. My excitement was tampered when I realized I thought of myself as being excellent at those skills already, and I was shocked that my scores had so much room to improve. <laughs> I hadn't become bad at communication, but I had developed some bad habits. It had inadvertently become more important for me to demonstrate my intelligence, even at times than, more important than finding common ground with my patients or colleagues. I think this naturally occurred as part of my training focused on developing my competence. Those communication skills I was once excellent at were left to atrophy in the dark, dusty corner known as my blind spot. <laughs> Learning improv had allowed me to explore these blind spots and provide the opportunity to get better at them in a safe environment. My improv training continues, uh, and I'm now regularly performing several times per month, 
and I'm increasingly using the lessons I learned to teach the medical students and residents that I work with. Then, in 2017, I had five cancer diagnoses in my immediate family members. Being on the other side of healthcare more than ever in the past, I saw a lot of good, but I also saw several instances of harm caused to my family members by the way that smart and caring healthcare professionals communicated. As an example, my sister-in-law, who had been diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer, got a call from a nurse, and the nurse said, your labs are bad, and you need to follow up with the doctor at an appointment in two weeks. The nurse might as well have said, why don't you not sleep for the next two weeks? <laughs> it is true the labs were bad, but they were actually the same as previous results, so the lab results were more or less insignificant. When this was brought up at the aforementioned two-week appointment, my sister-in-law's concern and the stress that it caused were completely ignored by the doctor, and the visit proceeded on with what potential treatment options might be. This is in no way pointing the finger at those healthcare professionals, because when I heard the story, I initially sided with the doctor and the nurse. This was another realization of my own blind spots that came through my understanding of improv. Whenever something was uncomfortable, I would just say something that I knew, even if that didn't acknowledge my patient's reality. I didn't remember any specific example, but I knew I hadn't been perfect. I was deeply afraid that I could have caused harm to someone else's family through the way that I communicated. Those events are what pushed me to teach improv workshops to other healthcare professionals. Learning improv had allowed me to explore my blind spots, as well as forced me to acknowledge there were areas that I needed to improve. Again, the laughter was a sugar to help my own medicine go down. Almost all healthcare professional education includes content related to positive communication. Most even provide opportunities to practice it with standardized patients. More often than not, ideas of positive communication are quickly disseminated, and the importance of skill development ongoing throughout a lifetime gets squeezed out by the material that will be on the test. This leads to healthcare professionals developing their communication by observing instructors in their field. What lessons a student gets is luck of the draw. To say nothing of the fact that there's a big difference between hearing or observing positive communication principles and actually practicing it. Therefore, healthcare professionals develop their communication style by trial and error over years of practice, if at all. Well, the unfortunate thing about that is it's been shown that doctors' performance usually plateaus or even worsens as their career goes on. Obviously, not every doctor, and if there's a doctor listening now, this applies to every doctor other than you. <laughs> but for the rest of us, right as we're developing our sense of communication, our overall performance is going down. Continuing medical education and attempts to address this, usually through lectures or more testing, have not been shown to have a significant effect on patient outcomes. If we hope to help healthcare professionals become the best that they can be, we must utilize the principles of deliberate practice as described by Anders Ericsson in his book, Peak. A few of the essential components of deliberate practice include getting outside of your comfort zone, like standing in front of an audience, not knowing what you're going to say. It requires someone who can provide feedback or an objective view of success or failure, like an audience that either laughs uproariously or stares blankly at you. It requires building upon previously acquired knowledge so you can grow in a stepwise fashion, like being required to make up something new each time you step on stage. It requires that you learn from mistakes, as is the only option on the improv stage. And deliberate practice suggests using mental representations to simplify large, complex concepts. As you learn improv theater, it feels like it is taught almost exclusively using mental representations. The first and most famous of these mental representations is yes and. By practicing yes and, it requires bravery and vulnerability to say yes to your scene partner's reality, even if it wasn't your idea. And then you make a choice to add to that reality so that you create a new reality together. 
in the hospital or clinic, this makes patients a partner in their healthcare rather than me issuing edicts from on high. It also helps in developing care plans with colleagues. By practicing yes and, I'm always able to be collaborative while also staying more to the perspectives and ideas that are important to me. Both of those can be very challenging in the general uncertainty of the hospital, or if there's ever a worldwide pandemic, maybe one caused by a coronavirus. Another common improv aphorism is there are no mistakes. Now, there are definitely mistakes in healthcare, and there are actually mistakes in improv too. It's what is done after that mistake happens that this idea becomes so important. On the improv stage, where everything is made up in the moment, mistakes are bound to occur, and dwelling on them will sink a performance. It's also possible to use that mistake to take the performance somewhere even more interesting. Mistakes are an opportunity to have fun on the improv stage. In healthcare, over a large enough time scale, mistakes are bound to occur. And rather than hiding them or trying to ignore them, seeing them as an opportunity to learn and improve as a unit leads to the best possible outcome. Mistakes are an opportunity to grow, if seen in this light, which can be a very tough sell to people who have been judged by their performance on multiple choice tests for most of their life. When we make up our scenes on stage, we're told to find the love, or why do we care about today? This gives the audience a reason to care about what they're watching, and the performers a reason to not just say their lines and then scamper away. Finding a reason to care or to know that what we're doing matters in the hospital is always present, but that feeling can be lost in the busy work in the electronic medical record or other logistical tasks. One of the first lessons we learned in level one improv is you don't have to be funny. Improv is not about being funny, but finding and having fun. Forcing jokes or pre-planned ideas into scenes is the perfect recipe to bomb on stage. In that same vein, patients don't care what I know until they know that I care. As part of my call to action from seeing my, patients, my family members as patients, I created improv workshops on all of these ways that improv has helped me as a physician. They were marketed as communication workshops rather than improv workshops. I was very nervous that no one would come. But they sold out with waiting lists. <laughs> There's a hunger for training and development in these skills. Some of the workshop attendees didn't interact with patients, including people from places like the business office. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either. <laughs> they asked if this was still going to be relevant to their job, to which I, of course, said, yes, and. <laughs> then very quickly made sure the discussion points included content related to their professional activity. I continued to develop workshops during the pandemic, while taking appropriate mitigation measures. I even taught the same level one class that my wife got me for Christmas all those years ago that got me started on this journey. During that time, I definitely made organizational mistakes. But since we all agreed there are no mistakes, <laughs> I definitely made opportunities to grow. One of those opportunities to grow was that lots of people will sign up for a communication workshop. Far fewer will sign up for a workshop if it is advertised as an improv workshop. This pushed me to try to understand the reality of the people I was hoping to affect through these improv experiences. These same skills that I used to grow my relationships with patients and colleagues now allowed me to grow my educational programming, even in the uncertain world of the pandemic. To grow my programs that used improv, I had to scale up the skills I use from improv. Very meta. Each workshop was unique, and even workshops that had similar content and the same exercises, the experiences and learning points shared were always new. The laughter was the same, but each workshop brought new insight. It was profound to see the effect that going through these exercises had on other healthcare professionals. My most common instruction in all of these improv experiences was encouraging participants to say yes and, not just to each other on stage, but to themselves and their own ideas, especially when they are faced with uncertainty. I had undergone that same transformation without even realizing it, and now yes and is my default response. It has become who I am. By practicing improv, I have become both more confident to express my ideas and also more curious to grow my world, even when it's outside my comfort zone. The idea of yes and now guides how I see everything, including how I interact with people, how I approach new situations, 
and even how I deal with that pesky voice inside my head, who has become much less pesky. The skills practiced in improv theater are the same skills necessary for a profession that deals with communication. There are many ways to improve these skills with the knowledge that they often exist in a blind spot. To develop these skills, moving past the edge of your comfort zone is an absolute must. This occurs on the improv stage, and the fun that is had is your immediate reward. The benefits and joy that can exist beyond your edge are felt and understood. There becomes no other choice than to engage in the world in this way. Saying yes to that Christmas gift has allowed me to grow my performances of physician, expand beyond my role as a physician, and discover more joy in my life. And it can for you and your professional life too. Thank you.